a seat. Uh, so you can turn your Bibles, if you have them, to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, we'll be verse 9. Uh, if you don't have your Bible or your device, the words will be on the screen and come up. But we're continuing our series on Talks with God. And today we're going we're gonna to learn to talk with God like Jesus taught us to talk with God. That's what we're going to start talking about. Now, but before we get there, last week I had you do something. I had you write prayer requests on uh, a note card that looked like these over here on the board. Um, and I said we're going to have all those prayer requests up here on the board when we're done, but uh, the person, Dan, who is our um, who is our discipleship director, and he handles all the things dealing with prayer and discipleship and stuff, they had a family emergency. His grandmother's not doing well, and so they had to fly down to Texas uh, to be with her and with his family. So they weren't able to be here today. So I don't have them up there today. They'll be up there next week. But um, I just want to give you the opportunity. Last week, if you weren't here, um, last week we talked about really praying by faith. And, and Jesus made some radical claims about prayer. He made claims that said stuff like, you know, if you abide in me, anything you ask in my name, it'll be answered. Um, and that's, that's a pretty, I mean, it's, he didn't make any caveat really. He didn't say, oh, you know, you got to do this three-step process. It was just there. Anything you ask in my name, it'll be given to you. Uh, I'll answer it. The Father will answer it. And so, so we had this idea that, man, what if we really prayed by faith? Like, what if we prayed and didn't have that deep down in our gut if we're honest with ourselves, yeah, God could answer it, but he probably won't, like that type of attitude? What if we just did that? And so we challenged everyone to write down a prayer on the note card. And we, had, we this past Tuesday, uh, those of us who gathered for prayer, we prayed over every single one of those prayers. Uh, every single request, we prayed for them. And we're going to continue to do that as a church. But what my hope is is that we put them up here, and as a prayer request gets answered, on the back side of the card, you can go find your card and write the answer to the prayer request. Um, you know, it may be, it may not be the answer you want, but if it's answered, it's answered, right? Um, so, so I'm going to just give you real quick the opportunity. There should be some pens in front of you. You got some note cards there. If you weren't here last week and you want to write down, here's the question I ask: If God could perform one miracle in your life, like not, we're not talking super broad here, specific to your life. If God could perform one miracle in your life, what would it be? What would you ask God if you could ask God for anything? So, just I'm going to encourage you. And maybe you made a really broad prayer request last week, and you want to make a more personal one this week. Because that, that's, that's the question. Make it personal to you. What's, maybe it's something to do with job, money, relationships. I don't know. I don't know your life necessarily, so I don't want to tell you what to pray for. But whatever, if there's one miracle you could ask God for in your life today, what would it be? And so I want to ask you to write those down. And uh, you don't have to put your name on it. If you want to, you can. Uh, but at the end of the service... You can, either, uh, you can either put an offering basket or you can come put it up here on the board. You can put it the right side up, the back side up. We've got these little magnets. There's magnets on the back, too. Uh, you can throw it on there. And we're going to start to pray for these on a regular basis as a church. And then we're going to see how God works and how God answers them. Because we want to rejoice as a church when we see God doing something. And I believe that Watershed Church will only grow if God is at work. It's not going to grow because Eric does something or because you do something or because whatever. I don't know. Maybe someone runs a great news story about us or a horrible news story. I don't know. Uh, but it's not going to grow for any of those things. It's not going to grow because we are great marketers because I'm not a great marketer. And, and I don't want it to grow because of that. I want it to grow. I want people to look at Watershed Church and say, wow, God is doing something that only God can do. That's the most important thing to me as your pastor is that we see God do something that only God can do in our lives and in the lives of this church. And here's the thing. God's not going to do miraculous things in the church until he starts doing things personally in your own lives. We have to come to God by faith individually before we're going to see him do something corporately. So I, I encourage you to take a, a few minutes and just, even while I'm talking, write down some prayer requests. Or, or later on, maybe, maybe something will come to you uh, throughout the service and you can do that. So, the Lord's Prayer. For many people, it's something you've heard since childhood. Like, you've heard the Lord's Prayer. Even if you don't really go to church, you've probably heard of it. Uh, even if you didn't know it was the Lord's Prayer, many of you simply know it as the Our Father, right? Like, my, my dad grew up in a Catholic church, and 
There's certain times you got to go say so many Our Fathers. I personally don't know how that works because I didn't grow up in the Catholic Church, but that's the way they tell me it works. Like you would go and confess your sin to the priest and he'd say, go say for Our Fathers, right? Am I right? Is that the way it works? Yeah. So, so, that, so that's kind of what we know about, about the Lord's Prayer. But it's much, much more than something we just say as penance for our sins. It's way bigger than that. It's Jesus actually giving us instructions on how to talk with God. And here's the thing. He knows how to talk with God because, one, he did it all the time. Like, Jesus like, constantly talked to the Father. And secondly, Jesus is God's only begotten Son. And so Jesus knew how to handle his dad. It's like a lot of us, we know how to handle our parents, right? Like, when you get married... You know, your spouse may not know how to deal with your parents. You say, look, this is the way you talk to my mom. This is the way you talk to my dad. And, and you'll be okay. Or this is what they mean when they say this, right? We kind of have to, because we're coming from two families or two different cultures, right? And so they come together, and you're melting these two cultures. And we say, look, this is the way you got to talk to my parents. And so Jesus is the same way. Jesus said, this is the way you need to talk to my father. This is what he wants to hear. And so, so we have the Lord's Prayer. Here it is in Matthew chapter 6. If you want, now this is a little different version, so some of the verbiage might throw you off. That's not the classic way. But, uh, but if you want, we, why don't we just read it together on the count of three. One, two, three. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. See, that's a different part. Your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. There you go. That's the Lord's Prayer. Slightly different version than what you learned, but that's okay. There's different uh, translations of the Bible. They all mean the same thing, uh, just a different way. More modern spin on the language. So as we look at this, there's, there's a few things that I want to see that the Lord's Prayer actually does. We're actually just going to focus... On the Our Father in Heaven, Your Name Be Honored as Holy. That's, that's what we're focusing on today. Just that little line, that verse 9, that first given. Here's the first thing I want you to see. First thing I want to see is that this prayer defines the relationship. It defines the relationship. In fact, specifically the Our Father part. That defines the relationship. Have you ever listened to children playing a game? Inevitably, there's one child who's the enforcer. Right? There's that kid... That kind of is in charge. It has to be their way. They know the rules inside and out, or at least they claim they do. And even if they, you know, even if they fudge on the rules, they, they want it to be to get their way, right? They like they just do it. They know everything. Um, and they gotta tell everyone what to do. And if the group has more than one child who wants to be the enforcer, then an argument will happen. Right? Like you'll start to hear two kids yelling and fussing and fighting with each other. And in the midst of the argument, you'll typically hear something like this. You'll, you'll hear a kid say, you can't tell me what to do, you're not my dad. Or you can't tell me what to do, you're not my mom. Or you're not the boss of me, you're not my parents, right? Has anyone ever heard a kid say that? Yes. Have you ever said that as a kid? Yes, we almost all have. That happens. You see, the, the, defining the relationship with someone also determines the rules of the relationship. And so, just like these kids understand instinctively that, hey, you're no different than me. You don't have the right to tell me what to do. But they also know that there are people in their lives who absolutely have the right to tell them what to do. First and foremost being one of their parents. And so to call someone father, it does several things. First thing it does is this. It makes them family. If you're going to call someone father, it makes them family. Like, that's kind of the no-duh thing, right? Like, you may not think about it, but when you say our father, there's a relationship that's automatically there. Like, I think most of us place our family above most of the other relationships in our life. Would that be pretty fair to say? I know, I know some relationships are tough and can be difficult, but most of us, there's some sort of familial relationship, whether it's a parent, whether it's a brother or sister, whether it's a spouse, whatever, it's a cousin or aunt or uncle, grandparent, you have someone in your life that's family most of the time, and that person takes precedence over everyone else in your life. Why? Because they're family. 
And so when we say, when we pray our Father, we're automatically saying that, hey, this relationship is important. This relationship isn't just like any other relationship. This relationship is something that I have with family. It's intimate. It's someone that I know intimately, and it's someone who knows me intimately. And so the first thing is, it makes them family. Second thing is this. When we say our Father, it makes them provider. It makes them a provider. You know, there's a reason it's a crime to leave young children alone for long periods of time. Right? It's heartbreaking, but you see it. In fact, I saw in the news last week, someone left their toddler in the car in the freezing cold for several hours. And fortunately, there are some passerbys who saw what was going on, and they're able to get the child out, and the child was safe, and was happy. But that parent is then charged with abandonment, right? Why? Because that child can't care for itself the way it needs to. The child didn't know how to get out of the seat belt, out of the car seat, and out of the car, and into warm and safety. They didn't know how to do that. And because kids are incapable of tearing themselves in the best way possible, they, I mean, you know, sure, kids, if you leave them at home, like if I left a five-year-old or a four-year-old at home alone, they might be able to muddle through for a little bit. You know, like put a bowl of candy on the table and just leave them there for a little bit, they'll be fine. But eventually the candy's going to wear out. And they're going to try to start doing stuff. I mean, can you imagine what would happen if you left a toddler at home? What if, you try, what if someone says, I'm hungry, and they try to start the stove like they've seen you do? But the gas just turns on, right? And it causes, eventually, a child, a young child left unattended will cause harm to themselves and probably to those around them, too. Something bad is going to happen. And so as parents, we have to provide for our children. We provide the care that they need. Like, they can't go out and get a job to pay the rent on a house. None of my children right now could get a job that pays enough money That'll put a roof over their head and food on the table. Not a single one of them can. And I got bright children. They're, you know, knocking on 17 and 16 and, you know, but they can't do it yet. They can't still provide for themselves. And beyond that, they're not ready to make major decisions for themselves. And that's the relationship that God says we need to have with him. We need to look at him as provider. Every good and perfect gift comes from above is what God tells us, what the, what the Bible tells us. And we need to rely on him for all those things in our lives. Left to our own devices, we end up wandering away and living a lifestyle that's harmful to us and harmful to others. If we just do everything that we want to do selfishly, then we're going to hurt people. We're going to hurt ourselves away. Look at the world that we live in. Most of the world laughs at us if we say, man, I want to live the way God wants me to live, they laugh at us. But if you look at the world, the world is a mess. Why is it a mess? Because they don't look at God as their provider. They don't look at it as someone they need to look to to take care of them, to help them think the way they need to think, to have the things that they need them to have. So calling God a father makes them family, makes them provider. If you call someone family or a parent, it makes them respected. It makes them respected. Psalm 29.2 says this, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in holy array. And in Exodus, in the Ten Commandments, it says, You shall not take the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. You know, I think it's important that we don't flippantly approach God. Like, it's okay to be confident, like, like, to know that you have God's ear, right? Like, I never want my kids to be scared to come to me. Like, I want them to know that they always have an open door. They don't have to be, oh, no, I hope I can talk to Dad today. Otherwise, you know, if I catch him on the wrong day, he's going to lose it, right? Some of us have probably been in relationships like that. Like, you're just like, man, what's today going to be like? Walking on eggshells. God doesn't want us walking on eggshells, but at the same time, well, I want my kids to have an open door to me or to their mother. I still want them to treat us with respect, just like I want them to treat each other with respect, right? Like, you want to come to them and say, I understand that you have the power to ground me, right? Like, I, I, have the, I understand that you're the one that provides for me. I understand that you're the one that loves me and knows what's best for me right now at this point in my life. And so when we come to God, 
When you have someone who's a father, especially a loving father, they're respected, right? Like if you have a dad who really cares for you and loves you and is a good dad, then you respect him for all those reasons that we just listed. And God being a loving God, a God who, who's gracious and merciful to us and powerful, demands our respect. Next thing is it makes them loved. It makes them loved. A good father is loving and should be loved in return. If you feel fear and anxiety constantly, your prayer isn't our father. Like if you constantly feel fear, feel fear and anxiety in your life, then when you pray to God, I don't know if you're really in a relationship with God when you pray because God does not want you to feel like God loves you very much. And if you're constantly scared of God, then that's not a prayer that's in the prayer and relationship. You may just be, praying, just be saying a prayer just in case you don't get the job done. In other words, a lot of times what we do is we have a just-in-case prayer. We say, man, I can work hard. I'm smart. I'm intelligent. I know how to grind. I know how to get it done. I know how to make the money. And I'm going to work really hard. And I'm just going to say a prayer just in case something happens. Like just in case I don't get the job done. It's kind of like just a tagline. But when we're talking about a father who loves us, that's the first person we go to. Like my kids wanted to go to a concert that's coming up at the end of this month. And uh, you know who the first person they came to to ask if they could go to the concert? Me. Because I'm the one that has the authority to give them the concert. They also know that I love them. And I love for them to be able to experience good things. And if it's possible, I'm going to help them go to the concert. It's a good concert. It's a fun, safe concert for them to go to. It's Toby Mack. It's a, a Christian artist. So I knew it was a, it's a good concert for them to go to. And they came to me with that. And that's the same way we should be with God. God shouldn't be the tag on just in case. God should be the first person. God loves you more, but more and better than you know how to love yourself. Do you understand that? Like, it's unbelievable how God loves us in ways that we don't even imagine. And so finally, the last thing to define the relationship is it puts them in charge. It puts them in charge. When we say our Father, there is an authority attached to that. And that kind of brings us to, once we define the relationship, that kind of segues into we declare God's authority. That second phrase, our Father in heaven. In heaven. You know, when the kids argue and they say, hey, you know, you can't tell me what to do. You're not my parent. They're basically saying you have no authority and I give you no authority. They're defining the rules and the relationships and the boundaries. You know, but sometimes your address gives you authority in life. Take the White House, for instance. Now, you may or may not like the person in the White House right now, but that doesn't really matter. Since the White House was built, the person who lives there, the person who resides there, whether you like them or not, whether you voted for them or not, whether you agree with them or not, it doesn't matter. The person who lives in the White House has great authority. What is the address? 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue? 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. If that is your permanent address, you have tremendous authority. And that's the way it is for God. Because God resides in heaven. Basically what it's saying is, God, you are an infinite God. You have no beginning. You have no end. And because you are infinite, because your throne, because your home is in the heavens far above this earth, beyond this galaxy, you have great authority. Jesus claims this authority in Matthew 28, 18. It says this, Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. You know, when we pray the way Jesus taught us, we recognize and give God authority in our lives. In other words, the prayer isn't just gimme, gimme, gimme. The prayer is, God, I want you to have control of my life. This is what I want. This is what I need. But God, however you want to give it to me, if you decide not to give it to me and give me something else instead, you have total authority in my life. You know, you may not like God. You may not even believe God exists. But that does not change the fact that he does exist. Like, 
I could believe with all my heart that gravity doesn't exist. With all my heart. I could believe that it doesn't, it's not real, it's fake, scientists have made it up, it's all a, a conspiracy just to control us and to keep us from flying. They don't want us to know that we can fly because if we can fly, then they wouldn't be able to make money for the airlines. I don't know. We, I could, that could be my crazy conspiracy theory. But guess what? If I go over to the Ben Franklin Bridge and I stand on top of that bridge and I say, gravity, you don't exist, and I jump off the bridge, guess what happens? I plunge into the Delaware River, whether I want to or not. Just because I say it doesn't exist doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And I don't know what your relationship is with God. But you can believe that he doesn't have authority. You can believe that he doesn't exist. But the fact is, he does exist, and he does have universal authority. And nothing you believe or don't believe will ever change that fact. As, as night follows day, that's just the way it is. What most of us really struggle with is what God's authority tells us to do. You know, God's authority speaks to every single aspect of our lives. It speaks to our finances. It speaks to our relationships. It speaks to sex. It speaks to religion, to work, to marriage, to parenting, to government. There's nothing left untouched by the authority of God. He gives us a way to respond to everything in our lives. He gives us a way to live in every moment of our lives. And if we're going to be honest, that may be a little intrusive to us. It may seem a little intrusive. But I think there's some, some reasons that we don't like to give God authority. First reason is, is, like I said, you may not believe in God. And you may even say that you believe in God, but you act like you don't. Let me put it this way. Like you may, with your head, say, yeah, you know what? I believe God exists. I, I believe that's true. But then, when you see all the things that God says and tells us how to live, you totally ignore that. You say, that doesn't make sense. And so with your head, you say you believe God. But in actuality, the way you live your life out, your life says, no, I really don't believe God because I don't do anything that he says I should do. The second reason we don't give God authority is because we just don't want to. I mean, let's just, let's just be real. Sometimes we just don't want to because we want to do something that's completely different than what he wants us to do, and we're just going to do what we want to do, right? That's it. You've seen the child do that. Like, I'll never forget the first time, my, all, every single kid, like I, I remember the first time they deliberately disobeyed me, right? Like it was, it was almost always like don't touch that or don't do that, right? And as I say don't touch that, they kind of look at me, they smile, and they go, and they're just giggling, and then they touch it, right? I'm like, that's it. They, I'm like, you could tell they were doing it on purpose. It really frustrates a parent. But they're doing it on purpose. <laughs> and sometimes that's, that's exactly what we do with God. We just don't want to give him authority. He's like, don't do that. It's going to hurt you. He's like, please, I'm trying to save you from a lot of pain and a lot of hurt. We're like, ah, I'm going to do it anyways. The third thing is, his authority, God's authority, is different than the world's advice. You know, God knows exactly. He made us, right? He created you and he created I. You and me. <laughs> he created you and he created me. A little grammar correction there. And he knows exactly what's best for us. But man, when we look around and we see all the world, the advice that the world gives us, it doesn't really stack up. And because... People are real flesh and blood, right? Because we can see them, we can touch them, we can audibly hear them. It just makes so much more sense to listen to the people around us. And please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying not to get wise counsel. But sometimes, man, we just listen to anything and everything that comes at us. We never pass it through the filter of God's authority. And so, man, because we can see it, because we can touch it, because maybe they had a good experience, it doesn't matter what God says. We're going to listen to them, and we're going to walk this way instead. But when we pray our Father in heaven, we have to recognize that that prayer gives God authority. And I'm almost done. I'll wrap it up. Last, last point. We, uh, we define the relationship. We declare God's authority. And then we distinguish God's character. It says, uh, 
your name be holy, or the traditional way is hallowed be in your name, right? Everyone, everyone probably learned it that way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Um, it literally means your name be honored as holy. God is a holy God. That's his character. When you say hallowed be your name, you're admitting how holy God is. And, and this is important. Too, too often we equate God with other myths. Or it's just some kind of novel idea. Of, we reduce him to a construct of our mind. Like whatever it is we think God should be like, we make him like that. Right? There's certain things about God that make us uncomfortable. And we just take the parts that make us uncomfortable and we say, ah, I want to do away with that part of God. I'm going to replace it with something that I think seems a little bit better. Or what the world seems a little better. Does that make sense? And so we do that. But that's, that's not the way that Jesus taught us to approach God. The Bible is very clear that God is absolutely different from anyone or anything else. He's not the same at all. 1 Samuel 2, 2 says this. says, there is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Two things real quick that holiness does. That God being holy, distinguishing God's character as holy does. First thing is it gives us a standard to live by. We talked a lot about that. It goes back to the authority. The Bible says this, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. See, Jesus showed us a way to walk. He showed us a way to live. And he gave us a standard by which we can live by. And so when we say, God, you are holy, we say, God, you have set the standard, and I'm going to do everything in my power to live up to the standard that you set. Second thing is this. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back home, come on back up and be ready to play. God being holy means he always keeps his word. He always keeps his word. Titus 1, 2 says this, In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. So that means when we come to God to pray, when Jesus tells us to pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, or, or your name be honored as holy. Then we're saying, God, we know that we can believe everything you've told us. When we pray, we can pray your promises right back to you. In fact, I do that a lot. There are promises in the Bible, and I pray those promises right back to God. And I say, God, this isn't what I said. This is what you promised me. And because you're holy, because our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name, I know that I can trust you, that you're not lying to me, that you're telling me the truth, and that you're going to do everything that you promised you would do. You know, I think holiness of God, and I think of worship ultimately. In fact, in the book of Revelation, at the end of time, we see that there's angels and they're crying out to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And so one of the things I think about when I think about praying the Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy, I think, man, how am I worshiping God when I pray to him? How is my life worshiping God and saying, yes, God, you are worth it. You are high above everything else in my life. Anything else I could want or imagine, God, you are high above that. How, how do you come to God? I know I say it over and over again, but God is always, always, always about relationships. How is your relationship with God right now? Is your relationship set on your terms? Or is it according to God's terms? Because that makes all the difference in the world. But I encourage you, as we dive into the Lord's Prayer over the next couple weeks, and as we're leading up to Easter, start thinking about how do you come to God? Is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Have you trusted Jesus to save you from your sins? Do you believe he died on the cross? Do you believe that you're a sinner? That's something that we all have to come to grips with. I've come to grips with that in my life. That yeah, I am a sinner. As much as I like to brag about myself, and as great as I might think I am, I'm still a sinner. 
And that's how we have to come to God. And the great thing about him is because he's a father who loves us, he wants to forgive us of our sins. He's not there to make us feel awful, to fill us with guilt or shame. He's there to lovingly accept us as we are and forgive us and then to help us move on from our sin and learn what it is to give him the authority and the praise that he deserves. Let's pray. God, you're an awesome God. We love you. Lord, we thank you that you're totally different than any other person, Lord, than any other religion. God, you are the one true God. You are perfect and holy in every way. Everything you do is right. Every promise you make, you will fulfill. God, you never lie to us. You never deceive us. God, you desire to give us good things. Lord, we thank you for that. God, I just, I just pray that you help us learn how to come to you. Lord, learn what Jesus taught us. That you want a relationship with us. God, like a loving father has with his child. Lord, we want to give you authority. And we want to give you honor. So Lord, I pray that we, we do that today. I pray that we do that this week. Lord, for all these prayer requests that were written down last week. Lord, for every prayer request that was written down this morning already and that will be written down. God, I pray for it. Meet each person right now at the point of their need. God, show us. Show us that you'll do what you promise. And God, if we're praying for something that's completely against your character, show us that too. But God, I, I want to see you work. I want us all to experience your work as a church, your power as a church, God, so we can look and say, look at what God has done. And we can tell others, look at what God is doing. And we can encourage and increase the faith of the world around us because you